and welcome back to the CSET journey with me Ryan. In this next section we're going to start on the LAN switching fundamentals after finishing the networking fundamentals section and we're going to start with a history overview. For those who don't know you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn or Twitter. In the history overview we're going to have a discussion around four points in the timeline that I've highlighted. The first point is going to be around uh, 10 base 5 and 10 base 2. And then we're going to move up to why we had to come out with something more advanced than that, which are hubs. And then we move to bridges. And then after bridges, we're going to have a discussion around switches. So, starting at the beginning, what do we need to know about 10 base 5 and 10 base 2? Now, first of all, these will not be on the exam, it's not on the exam blueprint. Why have I put it in here? I think it's really important and allows you to really understand why these problems occurred and essentially the solutions that came out to to help with these problems. And I think it sets a good foundation moving forward for not only understanding the switching world, but some of the technologies and why they're designed the way they are. So first of all, 10 base 5 and 10 base 2. What is it? Well, it's a bus topology. And if you remember from the topology video, we said a, a bus topology is a single cable or a single collision domain and each device would connect off the back of that cable. So this cable would run all the way through the office and PCs would connect onto that cable. Each PC would be considered in the same collision domain and because of that if a single PC wanted to communicate on the wire they had to use the carrier sense multi-access collision detection meaning the PC had to first sense the carrier multi-access meaning there are multiple hosts on the medium and hopefully if it's free as in they listen for voltages on the wire and if there's not much voltage they're allowed to send their data if while sending their data there's a uh, voltage received in then they can make an assumption there was a collision that they detected and they would all have this random back off timer until the timer expires and then they'll all again start from the beginning they would sense the carrier and then hopefully they'll be able to send their traffic before a collision occurs again the problem with this is it didn't scale very well obviously if everyone wants to send traffic and the network starts to get busy there's only so much time and so many hoses that can connect to a single collision domain before there's too much overhead and hardly anyone can transfer any traffic. The other problem with this, it wasn't very easy to connect host to the network. So an example of that was if we have a look at the connectors that we used, we have two different types here. We had 10 base 2, which is sometimes referred to as thin net and 10 base 5 which is referred to as thick net and they had two different types of connectors you had this what's shown here a type of BNC connector I think it's called a T connector because of the T it represents and hosts would connect into that the downside with these kind of uh, BNC connectors were the if the network had to be extended, let's say for example you had the network terminated on both sides to stop the signals because that's what was required when you had a bus topology. If you decided to actually extend this cable because you had more hosts to connect to it, it would cause a network outage. Same would be true to an extent with ThickNet. <clears throat> but another problem ThickNet had was because it used these vampire taps, these vampire taps had to, as I said, sort of clamp down into the device. If it didn't touch the metal contacts correctly, or there are other problems with piercing it, or whatever it may be, essentially it could cause a network-wide outage if this was done incorrectly, because the signals would obviously, as I said, get sent to all the devices. It would traverse to the broken connector. It will generate a lot of noise, a lot of signals, and then bounce that back, causing problems. The beauty of these type of designs back in the day, before, before sort of uh, 10 base T, 
that's 10 base T, became what it is or what it's going to be as time moves on, was there was no need for centralized hardware. The cables were cheap and people just connected into them. So what happened then was hubs and repeaters came out. And this is where, first of all, our topology or our mindset of what a physical and logical topology changes. Previously we had, on the other slide, like I said, this bus topology where all these devices connect onto the cable and when one device sent the traffic in, all the devices received that traffic, whether it was destined for them or not. And because it was handled at layer one, it didn't matter whether it was a layer two or layer three broadcast, multicast or unicast, because it was only propagating the signals and not looking at the signals it's propagating, everyone would always receive it. And as I said, this is because they're all in the same collision domain. Well, we took a hub or a repeater and let's draw out what the topology would look like for these. You would have a bunch of PCs all connected back to a centralized place. And this would represent a star topology. But the problem you've got here is it's only representing a star topology as far as the physical element is concerned. Because the hub and repeaters still, just like the name implies, repeats the signal. Meaning if a host were to send the signal in, it will still need the CSMA CD to be running on the Ethernet standard to sense the carrier because it's accessed by multiple devices and hopefully there's not a collision. And as it sends traffic on, again, regardless of that type of traffic, everyone on that link will receive it. So logically, we call this a bus topology still, but physically it's actually now a star topology. So some of the benefits that came along with a hub. First of all, we have this centralized place that everyone could connect back into instead of a long windy cable across the office. It also allowed us to extend the distance of the LAN. So if we had a hub here, let's say connected to another hub, and off the back of this hub we had a 90 meter cable with a PC, and off the back of this we had another 90 meter cable with a PC, a hub allowed us to do this. Now, depending on the layer one design, there was still challenges with the CSMA CD because the further distance they are from each other, the harder it is for them to sense the carrier. In other words, make sure there's no voltages on the line because let's say it took them one second to check the voltage, time that voltage has been checked and deemed clear, this person could actually start sending traffic. However, it became flexible from the physical element to have a repeater or a hub rather than having this long bendy circuit throughout the network. Now, a few things to keep in mind is, like I said previously, they're still in the same collision domain, which also means they still share the same bandwidth. So if the hub can only offer 10 meg throughput, then everyone would share that 10 meg throughput. Now repeaters are not used today. You may see a few engineers carrying them around and the reason they carry them around is purely for diagnostics purposes. So let's say, give you an example, we have a switch and off the back of this switch you have two PCs and these two PCs, two PCs are trying to communicate using some application. What you could do is you can place a hub here and plug a PC, a diagnostic PC, running something like, let's say, Wireshark. And because the hub will repeat the signal out of both instances, from this PC, you're able to see the traffic going to and from the NIC card on this particular collision domain. So they can be used for troubleshooting, diagnostic, troubleshooting. However, normally you kind of just use a span or an R span port to achieve something similar to this. But I don't want to go too off the scope, just be aware that hubs, they repeat the signals, they're part of the same collision domain, they still have bandwidth limitations, they break up this idea between a physical and a logical topology, 
and they're very rarely used but can be used in diagnostic purposes today where you want to actually see what's going to and from a PC inside a collision domain. So what we needed was some method to break this collision domain because it's the collision domain that's causing us most of the problem and this is where the bridge came into play. It allowed us to combat the collision domain issue meaning every PC that connected into a bridge was on its own collision domain. What that also meant is any traffic that the bridge received the bridge would have a table called a MAC address table and know the address of every single device that was plugged into that bridge and because of that not all the traffic needed to be broadcast to everyone. And There's a few benefits of this. First of all the NIC cards on all the PCs had less utilization. There was more bandwidth available because if there was two PCs talking let's say for example these two PCs were passing traffic to each other then the PC at the bottom would still have all of its bandwidth available to send traffic whereas previously when they're in the same collision domain that wouldn't be possible if these two PCs were talking all that traffic would still be traversing to this PC down the bottom. We also have this concept of ports, queues and memory where as I said because it used this MAC address table when the frames came in to the interface on the device the device would learn who lives on that particular port and then on the base of that would know where to send traffic so not everyone received everything because the bridge was clever enough to know where everyone lives and because it knows where everyone lives the traffic goes out that interface only if it's destined for that device a couple of shortfalls of the bridge was it was all software driven meaning that the CPU was intensive and it could not scale we also tend to have bridges with only four to eight ports so it wasn't a really a, a ability to scale up to more ports because of the hardware limitation and all the ports were the same speed so if you had a 10 meg 10 megabit per second bridge all your ports would be 10 megabits per second so as time moved on you can see that we've gone from having this inconvenience of a single cable that everyone had to clamp onto but traffic was sent to everyone we then moved on to a star topology physically introducing the hub allowing everyone to connect back to a central device for easier management and then we also had this bridge came out that took that concept of the star topology made it a logical concept by introducing this ability to learn traffic as it comes in and out of ports to help prevent unwanted traffic being sent to individual host. So moving on to the last bit then which is switches which we have today. Just have a conversation around what they allow us to do. First of all switches unlike bridges which gave us only four to eight ports these can literally give us hundreds of ports you can get very big chassis and in, in the chassis you can have multiple switching cards and you can extend the switch to be something you know of hundreds of ports all the ports can be different speeds they can support 10 100 a thousand megabits per second and more they also have modules so not only does it support the tradition the traditional RJ45 connectors but they support things like the SFP modules that we talked about that are required for fiber connectivity. Instead of software we said that the bridges primarily used software and that was the limitation of both the speed and the amount of ports well the switches actually use hardware and they use a special chip an ASIC chip which stands for application specific integrated circuit and this chip allows us to take jobs that would normally be on the central processing unit and put it into hardware to allow it to be accelerated because everything was put into these chips you also had less collisions 
and no kind of real buffering issues because again you had line speed switching rather than having to rely on a central processing unit. You can see just the left here I've got this icon this is a traditional layer 2 switch icon and then to the right I have a different icon which is a layer 3 sometimes called a multi-layer switch and the difference being the layer 3 switch allows you to do kind of layer 3 specific protocols like run OSPF maybe put an interface on an um, so I maybe put an IP onto an interface as opposed of having to utilize something called an SVI, a switch virtual interface. Just like a bridge, each port is considered its own collision domain. And if the device supports VLANs, which are virtual local area networks, which is a topic we'll get into a bit later, it will then in turn break up what we call the broadcast domain. Okay, so that's all we've got time for in this lesson. I don't want to feel you had too much here. I appreciate that history is not exactly the, f the most fun topic you can do, but it's, to some extent it's one of the most important parts. We talked about 10 base 2, 10 base 5, which is the um, thin net and thick net. We talked that thick net uses those vampire taps. Whereas ThinNet uses the BNC connectors. We said that this was a bus topology and there would be a long cable throughout the office. Everyone would connect into it and it would be part of the same collision domain. We then said hubs came out which then gave us the ability to have a physical star topology but a logical bus topology and the ability to extend devices and to do a bit more with the layer 1 functionality of the network. Bridges came out and this allowed us to combat the collision domain problem where each device on a bridge learned about which was connected, which hosts were connected where and only propagated traffic out of the ports that it was actually needed rather than just everywhere like a hub did and a bus topology in general. And bridges then allowed us to have a logical and physical star topology. Bridges were great, but they had software limitations, physical port limitations, which is what switches overcome. They come out with the application specific integrated circuits, the ASIC chips, and having those chips allowed us to have faster switching and because a lot of the memory problems were solved we were able to have lots of ports and those ports could be at different variable speeds. I hope this has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing and if it has been please do like and subscribe.